नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग सलाम वालेकुम अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू एवरी वन ऑन अ वेरी हॉट टॉपिक टैक्सेबिलिटी ऑफ फ्री जोन एंटिटीज सिंस द अनाउंसमेंट ऑफ कॉर्पोरेट टैक्स लॉ देर हैव बीन अ लॉट ऑफ डिबेट्स रिगार्डिंग वेदर फ्री जोन एंटिटीज विल बी टैक्सेबल वॉट आर दैक्स रेट्स इन द फ्री जोन एंटिटीज वेदर दे हैव टू अप्लाई फॉर कॉर्पोरेट टैक्स रजिस्ट्रेशन what are the important criteria to qualify as a free zone entity and many much any many more things than is very important and critical to understand i pratik toshniwal along with my colleagues karishma and kushal will walk you through what are the important updates and what are the important laws regarding taxability of free zone entities but in a bottom line every free zone entity has to register for corporate tax that's for sure and there is no chance that a free zone entity can swipe out itself from registering from corporate tax so moving further we have been doing such webinars and sessions and lot of staff trainings since the inception of law and you know this webinars are conducted with a vision to simplify the law as much as possible we have this is probably our 50th or 52nd webinar and such webinars will keep happening on different topics which are very important for the business community in uae we have been also writing our opinion articles which have been covered by the leading newspapers across and our team has been working hard in creating videos and webinars on small topics which are very critical for all businesses i hope that whenever you get a chance these newspapers and videos can be helpful for you and if you need anything you can reach out to us so before deep diving into the topic of taxability i'll still want to take you through a slide which shows 140 countries taxability and the taxation that it carries in the globe throughout and with the introduction of pillar 2 we feel that in years to come there will not be any place where you will be enjoying 0% tax rates and if you see this chart on your screen we can still see that united arab emirates is still one of the lowest and which is 9% which is single digit and apart from it there is only one or two countries which even is single digit which is barbados bulgaria is 10% qatar is 10% so understanding the corporate tax and planning your structures becomes very key and whether free zone can be an important jurisdiction for your corporate tax is very critical to understand so delving in and taking it further i open the floor and give an opportunity to my colleague kushal to take it ahead thank you and stay tuned kushal i think you are on mute thank you sir and thank you everyone for joining this webinar uh, before starting the webinar uh, i just hope that you and your family or your loved ones are safe and healthy after this bad weather conditions in the uae so before diving into the taxations for free zone entities i just want to explain the basics of the uae corporate tax and what are the basic tax rates that are applicable to a qualifying free zone person or to a normal taxable person so for normal taxable persons the tax rates uh, tax rates are based on slab rates like if your net profits annual net profits are up to 375000 dirhams then tax rate will be 0% and on the income which is above 375000 dirhams 9% tax rate will be applicable and if you qualified as a qualifying free zone person then tax rate for qualifying free zone person entities will be 0% on qualifying income and 9% on non qualifying incomes so a free zone person a free zone person can be a qualifying free zone person after satisfying various conditions that are given given in article 18 of the corporate tax law so, so uh, not every free zone person is tax free or exempted from the corporate tax only free zone persons who are qualified as a qualifying free zone person are given the benefit of 0 uh, 0% taxation rate 
so uh, the conditions to uh, be satisfied uh, satisfied by a free zone person to be a qualifying free zone person are are given in the next slide uh, so the first first and major condition for the to be a qualifying free zone person there are uh, three conditions and two compliance conditions that are to be satisfied by a qualifying free zone person first you should maintain an adequate substance in a free zone or in ua then you should derive a qualifying income then you should satisfy the de minimis requirement we will be explaining these conditions in detail further in our presentation and there are certain compliance conditions that you should maintain your uh, audit fin uh, audited financial statements you should audit your books and accounts and you should follow transfer pricing rules and on rent pricing and if, uh, the corporate tax act gives us gives us the option that we have an option that if we satisfy all the conditions then we can opt for qualifying prison persons or we cannot opt for the qualifying person this is an option that we can choose on the basis of our business our uh, what is the quantum of our non qualifying activities what is the tax liabilities when we are qualifying free zone person when we are not qualifying free zone person then there is an option so if you if we satisfy all these conditions then we are qualified as a qualifying free zone person and if in any certain year if in, if in any financial year we fails to meet any any one of the those conditions then we uh, then we will not be uh, allowed to be a qualified free zone person for that particular year and for next four years also and then after four years we have to recheck that we are satisfying those conditions or not after uh, after that if entity is a qualifying free zone person that does not exempt entity from filing its returns and registering for the corporate tax so uh, every free zone entity must satisfy these particular conditions to be a qualifying free zone person so there is an option that we should opt for a uh, qualifying free zone person or not there are certain limitations that are given to a qualifying free zone person if you are being a qualifying free zone person you can't enjoy certain benefits from the corporate tax the limitations of being a qualifying free zone person are that you can't be member of a tax group so the main logic behind this that you can't enjoy two benefits at the same time you can't enjoy the benefits of being a uh, member of a tax group and or being a uh, qualifying free zone person at the same time you can't be you can't opt for small business relief small business relief gives a uh, relief to small businesses having revenue up to 3 million dirhams that they can opt for this option and this will give uh, them relief from paying the taxes you can't transfer your tax losses for the year in which you are a qualifying free zone person the logic behind this is that if you are a qualifying free zone person you are not paying any taxes and also if you are having losses in that particular year then you can't transfer that tax losses to set off in uh, future uh, taxable years the another limitations are that you can't be a member you can't be a member of a qualifying group and you can't uh, you can't get the relief from a business re restructuring relief these are certain limitations that a qualifying free zone person can have after he opts for the qualifying free zone person so to be a qualifying free zone person the management have or man management of the business have to take the decision decisions that they want to be a qualifying free zone person or not uh, after checking all these limitation and the benefit of the business we have after the, uh, after this i just want to explain the basic conditions like what are the basic conditions to be a qualifying free zone persons that are given that we have uh, just outlined in uh, uh, earlier slides the first major condition that you should have an adequate substance in a free zone first uh, of, uh, there are two tests one is income generation test and another is adequacy test in income generation test your core income activities core income generating uh, generating activities should be from free zone only that if you are having businesses in may uh, free zone then you can't generate your income from mainland your core income generating activities should be from free zones only then the adequacy test have three tests you should have adequate adequate assets you should have adequate number of employees and you should have adequate operating expenditures from the uh, that free zone from the free zone the adequate number of assets num, uh, employees and expenses may depend from business to business for small businesses the uh, num, uh, from small business or uh, so some businesses which are like services the adequate assets uh, adequate assets and adequate employees may be low for the manufacturing the adequate number may be higher so it will depend on free uh, business to business that what will be the adequate number of assets or employees so many people may have questions that if they can outsource these adequate assets or adequate employees 
these uh, aggregate substance to uh, another entities or not yes you can outsource these activities to another free zone entities sorry to another entities but that entity should be a free zone only you can't outsource these adequate uh, adequate substance to mainland you have to uh, outsource these to adic uh, free zone entity only and your that third party to whom you have outsourced the activities should be out should be under the supervision of that uh, free zone entity qualifying free zone entity only so this is about uh, maintaining adequate substance in UAE. Then another major condition is that you should uh, you should earn uh, qualifying incomes only. You should earn only qualifying income. So qualifying incomes have uh, four uh, criteria that these particular four types of incomes will be treated as qualifying income. First, you can earn any type of income from free zone entities. Means if you are entity registered in DMCC, and your customers are registered in other free zone entities like if uh, Silicon Oasis, DIFC. So you can earn income from those entities. Any type of income generated from free zone entities will be treated as qualified income. First is that, and you can also earn income from mainland entities or export entities. If you are earning income from mainland entities or export entities, then that income should only be come from qualifying activities. The uh, authorities have given some list of uh, around 12 activities which are considered as qualifying activities. So income earned from qualifying activities will be treated as, treated as qualifying income. Another in recent uh, ministerial decision number 265 issued by uh, FTA <clears throat> by the ministry, income derived from uh, ownership or exploitation of uh, intellectual property rights also be considered also are considered as qualifying income. And any other income which is in the limits of de minimis requirement, which which we are we will be explaining uh, later in the later in our presentation that what will be the de minimis requirement. So all these incomes will be treated as, treated as qualified income. So summarizing this sheet, any type of income generated from free zone, any income generated from qualifying activities, whether from free zone or mainland from exports, income from qualifying in intellectual property rights or other income which satisfy de minimis requirement will be treated as qualifying income. And if the, uh, just giving the basic idea of what is de minimis, our 95% of the business should come from qualifying income only. Then we are satisfying the de minimis requirement. So this was all, all about qualifying income and uh, its adequate substance in free zone. Then moving, moving further, I think the, there's an issue. Kashmir, can you please uh, move to next slide? So moving further, uh, earlier we have explained that what will be considered as qualifying activities. Authorities has given some list of qualifying activities, around 12 activities which are considered, considered as qualifying activities. There are three uh, three activities which related to uh, transfer of sale of goods or uh, related to goods. There are six, six activities which are related to services and there is one uh, another activity which is like holding of shares and securities. I, I, I'm here to explain the major uh, major qualifying activities but that what will be these activities. First, the manufacturing and processing of goods or material, it's a normal manufacturing like uh, if you are converting a raw material into finished material, you are processing certain uh, items, then that will be treated as uh, manufacturing and processing. The major uh, part here is that distribution of goods in and from a designated free zone. This is the only condition that is not available for all free zones. This is available to only designated free zones. The, for example, designated free zone uh, in UAE are like Jabal Ali free zone and Dubai airport free zones are considered as a designated free zones. And authorities has also given the list of various free zones which are considered as a, considered as a designated free zone. So meaning of distribution of goods is that we are uh, we are selling goods selling goods and uh, so selling goods or other materials to any entity from a designated free zone and the our customer should not be end customer our customer should use that goods or materials to uh, sell to their customers or use that in our process to sell finish their uh, to manufacture their finished goods so this is about distribution of goods another activity is trading of qualifying commodities this was also not in the Bayer Act, but added by Ministerial Decision 265 to the law. The trading of qualifying activity commodities will also be treated as qualifying activity. So what are qualifying commodities? Qualifying commodities includes minerals, 
metals, agricultural commodities, and other uh, such uh, um, uh, products which are traded in a uh, recognized commodity exchange. And the entity which is applying for uh, the this benefit should uh, should be in business of physical trading of these activities. So this is about qualifying commodities and holding of shares and securities, just defining this, holding of shares and securities mean we should invest in shares and securities of another entity and that should be for investment purpose only. That should not be of uh, a trading purpose. And for the being investment purpose, that should be deemed uh, or intention to hold must be minimum 12, next 12 months. Then that activity should be treated as holding of shares and securities. And another services which are treated, treated as qualifying activities are logistic services, fund management and investment services, uh, and head credit trade finance service, services, related, uh, services related to two related parties, ownership and management of uh, operation of SIP. And this, this is the list of six uh, activities, service activities that are treated as qualifying activities. Now I'm giving stage to Karishma to describe detailed describe the distribution of goods and other conditions to be a qualifying free zone person, other benefits about to for being a qualifying uh, qualifying free zone person. Thank you, Kushal. Thank you so much for explaining about all the major conditions to be treated as a qualifying free zone person. I hope you got a clarity about all these activities which will be treated as a qualifying activities. Now, before going into the excluded activities, like which activities will not be considered as your qualifying activities and which will be straight away taxable at your 9%, that is the standard corporate tax rate. There are many questions which, which come from the clients and from the audience that Will my general distribution, if I am being located in a in a Javza free zone, if I am located in the if Zaf free zone, if I am located into any other free zones, will the normal trading or the general trading activities that I'm doing, that is mere import or export or merely bringing the goods into the UAE and selling it to the mainland, will all these trading, as majority of the companies have been following the similar line of business, will that income treated as a qualifying income for a free zone? So let me give you a clarity on this why and how this distribution of your goods or materials or your trading business will be coming and when it will be coming as treated as your qualifying income. Now, as per the law and as per the ministerial decision, it has been it has been clarified that the distribution of goods or materials, which means it will include your buying and selling of your goods, your materials, any component parts or any other items that are tangible or movable and it will also include any kind of transportation importation storage that that will be importation and exportation and you are doing all such buying and selling and disposing of or selling this products or this goods and materials to a person who resells it further or using it for his manufacturing process then such kind of import and export or such a type of trading will be treated as a qualifying income in your hands now, just to elaborate this more, if say there is a company which is registered in Javsa. Now, Javsa is one of the designated zones as most of you might be aware. Now, there are certain criteria. There are more than 45 free zones into the UAE. And from those more than 45 free zones, there are few free zones which have been giving the definition of the designated zones. Now, these designated zones definition is the same which was given at the time when the VAT law was published. So, in the VAT law, there are very clear zones which will be treated as a designated zone and Javza is one of the major designated zone into the UA currently. So if your company say is located into Javza and you are doing a high say sales like if there is one customer one of the vendor who is sitting in USA and there is your client who is sitting in, the U, in, in India. Now in spite of transferring the goods directly uh, bringing the goods into the UA and then transferring it to the India the Javza entity a Javza and Javza entity does a high sales sales wherein the goods are not bought into the waters of the UAE and directly being transferred from USA to India via high sales sales. These kind of transactions where there is a high sales sales as per the public consultation document in which was released post this all decisions and all the law which came out it was being clarified that such kind of activities will be treated as a qualifying activities because the goods are not imported into the country if the con if the goods are not coming into the waters of the ue there shouldn't be any taxation on the same goods or materials or trading that we are doing 
Now, to be very clear that this activity, the high sea sales activities has been clarified and treated as a qualifying activity as per the public consultation document. There is nothing very specific coming into the law for this or neither any law or neither any decision or any guide has been very clearly provided. But most probably this is the this is the interpretation that such kind of sales will be treated as a call will be treated as a qualifying activity for all the businesses who are doing the high sales sales. Now there is another transaction which usually would happen between uh, between see the entities which are located in the UAE, wherein wherein the goods are first bought into the waters of the UAE and then it's being transferred or it's being sold to the other entities or other parts of the UAE. Say there is the same transaction in similar way where a jobs entity imports the goods, brings into the water of the UAE and then sells it to a company, a mainland entity. Such transaction as the goods are bought and then again being sold from a designated zone will be treated as a qualifying activity. Now it may happen sometimes that instead of bringing the goods into the UAE and then selling it to the mainland, it might be just a bill to ship to model wherein the goods are of course directly being transferred from a uh, directly being imported into the waters of the UAE but not via designated zone, via some another zone. In that case, as the zone or as the free zone is not a designated zone and the goods are not imported into the designated zone, such trading or such bill to ship to model where the, where the goods are being exported or imported directly from a country to the mainland in such cases it will be treated as a non-qualifying activities and such income will directly be taxable at nine percent this kind of models or this kind of business transactions will not be treated as a qualifying activity in your case so be mindful whenever we are importing or whenever we are doing any such transaction these transactions as explained that is one high sales, sales which may come into the definition of a qualifying activity and when the goods are first bought into the designated zone and sold from there only those transactions will be treated as your qualifying activity apart from that any businesses doing any transactions will be treated as a non-qualifying activity now this of course there are many other qualifying activities but these this is one of the major activities which people question and they have a lot of confusion about the same i hope i was able to clarify on this hot and very confusing topic at the same time now as i explained that there are some excluded activities which will be taxable directly at nine percent there is no benefit of these activities to be treated at zero percent so if you are into a banking business if you are into an insurance business or if you are into ownership and exploitation of an immovable property other than the commercial property i would very specifically come come on this point uh, with respect to taxability of an immovable property into the ue and if you are into financing and leasing activities except only when it is being provided to your related parties all these activities will be treated as your excluded activities of course the banking and insurance do have their own law in place and they will be taxable at the rate that is being applicable for them into existence now even when you are dealing with the natural persons say your business is such that you have to directly every time just deal with a natural person in that case also on whatever income you are deriving directly from a customer that will be treated as your excluded activity except only for some activities which are very exclusively given that is with respect to fund management or ownership on exploitation or management of your ships or with respect to the aircraft only those activities will be treated as your qualifying activities now coming to this overall application of how the corporate tax or how the corporate tax implications will be there with respect to a qualifying free zone person where we say that if a free zone is meeting and satisfying all the criteria as earlier explained by Kushal in this webinar that if it is satisfying all the conditions then income whatever is generated if these are from very specific streamline that if it is from free zone from a non-free zone person or from a commercial property or with respect to any other person then only such income will be treated as your qualifying income and it will be taxable at zero person apart from that if you derive any income from a natural person from your domestic or your uh, foreign permanent establishment on this point also there is a very specific example that we would like to cover to highlight that what income when it being it is being earned from a domestic or a foreign permanent establishment will be taxable and how it will be taxable if you are fulfilling all the conditions simultaneously it has it needs to be fulfilled all together at any moment if a free zone is not fulfilling any one condition then it will be treated as a non-qualifying free zone person and all such income will be taxable at standard corporate tax rates 
Now another condition which Kushal had earlier explained was with respect to de minimis requirement. This requirement is a very important requirement for any free zone person to be treated as a qualifying free zone person. It may happen that along with your normal qualifying activities, there may be certain income which is not a qualifying revenue for you. Suppose say if you are into manufacturing and processing of goods, but apart from that, you also have an interest income. Now the law says that only the manufacturing and processing of goods will be a qualifying activity. But the moment it is an interest income, say if you are having any fixed deposits into the bank or any such income, that income is a non-qualifying revenue. If that non-qualifying revenue is lower of your 5% of the total revenue of the entire company or less than 5 million, if, the, if that income is less than this 5% of total revenue or 5 million, then it seems or it can be derived that your non-qualifying revenue is below this threshold and your entire income, entire income means your qualifying income as well as this non-qualifying income which is within this threshold will be taxable at 0%. But if even the income that is being derived is more than 5% or 5 million, 5 million is the threshold. If it is above that, then you fail to satisfy the condition to be a qualifying free zone person and your entire income will be subject to tax rate of standard rates that is at the rate of 9%. Now, it has been very exclusively given in the law that while determining this non-qualifying revenue in respect of the de minimis requirement, there are three very specific transactions which you should not include while calculating the total of this non-qualifying revenue. Very first, the excluded activity, uh, sorry, very first it will be the excluded activities that will be treated as your non-qualifying revenue. You are any activities that you are dealing, suppose if you are having any income derived from the mainland entities, even that will be treated as your non-qualifying activities and transaction with any free zone person who is not a beneficial recipient. These all are a non-qualifying revenue and while calculating this non-qualifying revenue to specific income that will not be part of your non-qualifying revenue is very first that revenue that you are deriving from an immovable property which is located in a non-free zone person but only with respect to a commercial property or you are deriving an immovable property income from any person but from a property that is not a commercial property and any other revenue that is attributable say to your domestic permanent establishment or your foreign permanent establishment even that revenue will not be treated as a part of your non-qualifying revenue which means this income that is revenue from an immovable property and revenue that is attributable to your domestic permanent establishment of a free zone person or a foreign permanent establishment will be straight away taxable at 9% as it is neither part of your non-qualifying revenue nor it is coming under your qualifying revenue. So suppose say if you're having a company into the free zone in a job and you have your uh, branch into the mainland entity, then income that is attributable to your mainland branch will be treated, will not be part of your non-qualifying revenue and that income will be taxable at standard taxable rate of 9%. Just to give an elaboration on this part, uh, on the foreign permanent establishment or your domestic permanent establishment as explained earlier, as a free zone has a domestic say mainland branch or a foreign permanent establishment, it will be treated as your non-qualifying revenue taxable at 9%. As it is an independent and a separate person being a related party, of course, transfer pricing regulations will be applicable and these transactions should be at arm's length principle. As also explained earlier by uh, Kushal that the free zone entities for them to be treated as a qualifying free zone person, the important condition is they need to follow the transfer pricing rules and arm's length principle as well as the documentation needs to be done by them. Just to elaborate on this point, as the entity is registered in Javza and it is having one branch in, uh, into the mainland UA and one is having in, in, into the India. So income that is only for the income that is attributable or that is earned by Javza entity will be treated as a qualifying income and taxable at 0%. But the income which is attributable to their domestic permanent establishment or the foreign permanent establishment, it will be non-qualifying income and taxable at 9%. Coming to the last section of the, uh, of the presentation, which is with respect to a free zone property or what will be the taxability for an immovable property. Suppose I'm located in free zone and I'm earning income from a non-free zone person, but with respect to commercial property or I'm earning an income from any other person, but with respect to non-commercial property, then straight away my this income will be treated as a non-qualifying income and taxable at 9%. 
So only the income that will be treated as a qualifying income for a free zone with respect to immovable property is when a free zone is earning an income from another free zone person with respect to commercial property. Only that income will be taxable at 0%. Now there is a very clear definition that has been provided in the law that what will be treated as a commercial property or what will be treated as a non-commercial property. So commercial property is any property or any immovable property which is used exclusively for business or business activities and which will not include any activity which is being provided or a place of residence including the hotels or any kind of motels uh, establishment. So these activities or these uh, businesses if any kind of hotels are being ranked it will not come under the definition of commercial property. Just to elaborate on this uh, taxability of how immovable property will be taxable in the hands of the free zone persons. If suppose say uh, I'm earning from being a free zone, I'm earning from a business center. It's a commercial property as it is located in free zone and it is derived considered as an income derived from another free zone persons. Only such income will be my qualifying income. The moment I'm earning from a warehouse, even though it is a commercial property, it is located in the free zone, but as it is income not derived from another free zone person, it will be treated as a non-qualifying income. And lastly, being a hotel, but it is for a non, as it is a non-commercial property, although it is located in the free zone, it will be treated as income derived from a non-free zone person, but as explained earlier, that this income which is being earned from a hotel will be treated as your non-qualifying income. So with this, uh, we would like to end our session and complete all the applicabilities of how the qualifying free zone person would be taxable as there has been a lot of questions coming with respect to the taxability that will be there on the free zone persons. I hope we were able to put and throw a light on all the answers on all the questions that you have. Now we would like to have a poll some poll questions so that... before poll question karishma no. if i can get just two minutes to you know summarize few things sure. that kushal and you had said sure so sure, i'll sure. be i'll be bluntly honest to qualify first as a free zone person you need to have substance so there's a concept that was going to if a lot of people ask me what is the difference between mainland and free zone before the entrance of corporate tax, there were a lot of, you know, benefits that were available. But now that corporate tax is in place, a lot of the uh, amenities that you need to maintain in mainland has to be same in free zone. For example, you need to have office, right? Virtual offices will not work. If there is a virtual office, it will absolutely not work. So you need to have at least a desk space where you have adequate employees. That employee may be one or two qualified employees who are managing your business depending on the volumes. But you need to have a desk space for your work. It may be as small as 100 square feet. It depends on the businesses that you are running. So to be a qualifying free zone person, you need to follow office. You need to have audited books of accounts, which has become mandatory. The transactions has to be at arm's length principle. So doesn't matter even if a free zone is earning qualifying income. A free zone has to first qualify for a qualifying free zone person for which all these conditions are mandatory. And then when it passes this test and then subsequently passes the test of qualifying income, then it can get the benefit of 0%. So lot of entities in free zone probably, you know, who do not have an office and are not having huge turnovers can obviously, you know, take the benefit of opt as a normal corporate tax person and take a benefit of small business relief. But if you do not, uh, you know, don't think that because I have a virtual office, the substance test is passed. Absolutely not. And the second critical factor, which Karishma covered very nicely was on in and from designated free zone. So before the new ministerial decision was announced, there was a public consultation document which was published by the department and it clearly gave an example which said that high seas sales qualifies as distribution and hence it has the benefit of qualifying activities. So our stand is our stand stands you know very clear when it comes to high seas sales. However, nothing in the law has come up very clearly in black and white that says that high seas is covered when it comes to distribution of goods. So I hope this clarifies a lot of, uh, you know, understanding and confusion that is there.
But uh, before launching the poll question, I also wanted to take questions that were there in the chat box. So I have one question from Nimesha, who's asking if we are doing the free zone person's company calculation, our first step is checking the activity of the company and then the check, check the activity list and then need to check the customer and consider the rate. So Nimesha, you're absolutely right. You need to bucket it down first to see whether you have an office, you have adequate employees, you pass the substance test, whether you're maintaining the audit books of accounts or not. If that is done, then go to the activities, then go to you know your customers because a lot of this will is interlinked. And if all these criteria are met, then only you can get the benefit of a qualifying free zone person getting the rate of 0%. So it's very important to assess that. A lot of people at times feel that they only have qualifying income. But when we see their balance sheets, they have interest income, they have income from you know other sources, foreign exchange currency losses, which are not absolutely related to you know your business, but are something from investment income which doesn't qualify. So if it crosses the de minimis criteria, then you will have to understand that that income will make your books taxable at 9% and not 0%. So it's critical to evaluate all the line items of revenue before calculating or understanding whether it is a qualifying free zone income or not. Uh, thank you for this, Evan. I really appreciate it. Essentially, the understanding I derive is that DMCC story is over as it is not designated free zone. We'll have to move at Zafza. So I do not completely agree to this. A lot of people came with, with this query, but DMCC is generally a multi-commodity center, right? So a lot of agro-commodity products or, you know, commodities, minerals, metals are traded out of DMCC, which enjoys the benefits anyway in the corporate tax law. And trading of commodities is a qualifying activity. So Zavza, yes, if you're doing probably trading of goods and if you're into the story of, you know, manufacturing, but if you're into commodity trading, which is listed on a public, you know, recognized stock exchange and you're doing physical trading, then DMCC is valuable. It is not, the story is not over. For sure, it is not over. So you need to dig in the activity that you're doing. Uh, if I'm planning to cancel the license now, should I register for CT? Uh, we have at least guided all our clients that even if you have your license valid till today, you will have to register for, and there was a question earlier as well that said, how will we, you know, deregister? How will the liquidation work? So it's very simple. When you go for the CT deregistration, if you have taken a CT registration till date, and if you want to deregister, the first thing that the FTA will ask is, the balance sheet or probably the details of these four or five months that you have done, right? And if you have not taken a corporate tax registration, that's a risk that you carry because the penalty is 10,000 dirhams. So it's a risk. If they catch hold of you, you will have a penalty of 10,000 dirhams. If not, then you're lucky. But otherwise, as per the law, you will have to register and then apply for deregistration. That's, that's the story. Uh, hi, I fall under distribution of goods from or in designated free zone, if I sell goods to mainland company and then they are the beneficiary recipient, is that transaction still be treated as qualifying activity? I think, uh, you know, Kushal, uh, you had covered this very well and uh, Karishma had dropped in, uh, you know, detailed understanding of that. So Karishma, if you can want to, you know, uh, share some light on this, it'll be great. But to mainland entities, definitely it is a very different story. So over to you, Karishma. Sure. So this this question actually itself, when it's a, oh, I'm sorry, I think the question went away. No, so I'll I'll read the question for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So I fall under distribution of goods from and in designated free designated zone. zone. I'm selling to a mainland company, and they are the beneficiary recipient. Is Correct. that transaction still be treated as qualifying activity? So as as uh, uh, question says itself that 
you are doing distribution of goods from or in a designated free zone so it is the only important criteria when you are located into free zone if you are selling it to whomsoever but the goods are first imported and then you are distributing say even if you are doing export of goods even if you are doing to a mainland entity or even to another free zone person the only thing that would matter is that you are distributing and transferring it from your designated zone and the goods are properly imported into your designated zone if this condition is satisfied then yes of course the income that you are deriving from a mainland entity or from another free zone or even from export will be treated as your qualifying activity and in this case you itself said very clearly that the mainland company is a beneficial recipient so itself satisfies all the conditions which are required to be treated and uh, with, with that case it will be treated as your qualifying activity so i hope that answers uh, your question uh, that's the anonymous question actually so i hope it answers Thank you so much, Karishma. Uh, can we have a group for VAT and simultaneously separate entities for CT? I mean, this is a confusion. Again, you know, a lot of people have. VAT is a different law. Corporate tax is a different law. For VAT, whatever group you would have made is very separate from corporate tax, right? And the laws are very un different. So for CT, you need to register for each entity and then form a tax group if all the conditions that is 95% shareholding, voting rights are there and met, then only you can form a tax group. Otherwise, you cannot have a tax group. And that also not an individual. You need to have a holding company holding 95% or more. So uh, that whatever groups are there is a separate and for corporate tax, each entity has to register. And then if the conditions are met, you can form a tax group. I hope that answers the query. Uh, a mainland entity having branch and free zone, will the income earned by the branch be considered as qualifying income if engaged in qualifying activity? So uh, branch doesn't uh, earn, it's, it's branch and your entity is one and the same, right? It's For a subsidiary, the answer is different. But for a branch, it is a part of the same thing and you will not be enjoying this benefits. However, if it was a subsidiary, you can enjoy this benefit. So I hope, uh, you know, that cl clarifies your your uh, uh, question. Yes, uh, Nimisha, the list of designated free zones is very similar to that. The, uh, in the FTA law, as well as all the decisions, they've mentioned that you have to take it from VAT law itself. So the list is very much available. And, uh, you know, it is there. Uh, if you even Google it, you will get it. So that's not a challenge at all. Offshore companies, unfortunately, rose. The CT registration hasn't started and we are expecting a lot of clarity when it comes to offshore entities because uh, if you ask me whether offshore entities enjoy the benefit of free zone, the answer is still not very clear. So you will have to wait until further guidance. Uh, so I hope that I know that question is not answered, but we're waiting for some guidance from the FTA. Uh, so... I think Sanaj and uh, anonymous attendee, your answer, your questioning uh, on liquidation. So I'll be honest, right? April, we are on April 25th. If you have taken a corporate tax registration, right? And uh, if you are uh, planning to deregister it, the moment you apply for deregister, the FTA will give you all the guidance to, you know, first take all the benefits, right? So uh, you'll have to understand that uh, first you will have to apply for deregistration. The moment you apply for deregistration, FTA will give you guidelines to submit all your details. And once that is done, you will apply for liquidation. Before that, it will not be applicable. So mainland entity having branches in free zone will the income, I, I think that is covered. Can a company in Zavza owning a commercial property in another free zone, say DIFC? Claim the commercial property income. Uh, over to you, Karishma. I have a commercial property in DIFC and a Zavza entity is owning that commercial property. Can I uh, get the benefit? So for that, I think this slide itself clears all the questions. And before that, I think this slide clears all the questions uh, that you have. I think it's Mr. Mian. So uh, Mian, as you told, told by yourself that you are a free zone. 
in, in this case over here it will be a javza entity and you are owning a property and you are owning a commercial property which is also located into free zone in that respect it will be treated as your qualifying income mm -hmm. as you are also a free zone and you are also earning from another free zone not necessary it should be the same free zone of course as you are holding your property into another free zone it will be treated as your qualifying income so i hope it clarifies uh, me and your question as it's very simple and simplified question that you had being both into free zone you will be treated as a qualifying income so shakir has a question i think uh, for free zone companies import from china to india shipment goes directly but invoicing from free zone will it fall under corporate tax 9% I think it depends on, uh, you know, where your company is located. If it is from a designated free zone, like mentioned, third port shipment will okay. potentially be beneficial for 0%. But otherwise, if you're not fulfilling the condition, it will be 9%. Uh, our company registered in DDA free zone, company activities, consultancy, customer services, developer, can we exempt our business under corporate tax? So unfortunately, services... Uh, are, are taxable and only services which were mentioned which are regulated majorly or a holding company is getting the exemption otherwise every company that is doing marketing consultancy is unfortunately under the gambit of corporate tax and it will be any income that you earn will be taxed at nine percent uh, anything else if I'm changing my legal type from natural person to legal, if the change was completed in Itna, will I have three months from issue date like a new entity? Oh, sorry, this is a question on corporate tax registration. Registration. Uh, before that, I think we have covered all. I think there's just one question left. Uh from Mr. From Rakesh, where he says if a parent company in Javza selling goods to its subsidiary in India as th third port sell, will that be treated as a qualified income? That is, I think, one question left. Rest, I think, all of uh, them are being taken. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, Mr. Rakesh Ji has already explained that if your parent company, say, it's located in Javza and it's selling your goods, so wheresoever you are selling, uh, I'm sorry, I think so. the question is again gone. We just so it's just related to high C sales uh, high C sales as as it is being uh, directly with respect to your high C sales if you are doing the goods selling the goods to its subsidiary but as you mentioned that you are doing it to a subsidiary in India so if if the income that is uh, in subsidiary and branch there is a difference as explained earlier that if it would have been the branch in this case then it would have been treated as the income attributable to your permanent establishment and it may be treated as a taxable income but as you are selling it to your subsidiary and it's a third port shipment directly being sell from one entity to one other entity it will be treated as your qualifying income as these are two separate entities these are two separate legal persons subsidiary and your parent entity even though you will be, you know, combining and forming a consolidated financial statements, but as the subsidy is a separate legal person, the income that is being derived will be treated as your qualified income, being not a permanent establishment, but a subsidiary. So I hope that answers your question, Rakesh. Excellent. I think uh, we've covered most of it. Uh, so we can go to the poll and in the meantime, if there are other questions, we'll take them. So can a qualifying free zone person with revenue less than 3 million claim small business relief? I think five seconds we'll give for the answer. Let's see what the room has answered. So 36 people have 36 percent of the attendance had said so said it as yes and uh, 64 Excellent. percent has so answered the answer no. is no. Correct. 
Yeah, a small business relief is not applicable to qualifying fee zone. So you cannot have both the benefits. So moving ahead. Will a regulated fund manager in DIFC claim the benefit of qualifying fee zone person? Yes, it will be treated as qualifying activity. No, it is treated as excluded activities. I think five more seconds. Yes, go ahead, Karishma. So majority, 63% of the audience has answered it as yes, as it will be treated as a qualifying activities and 38% has mentioned it as no, it, as it will be treated as a qualifying activities. So the correct answer is yes, of course, it's as being a fund manager uh, that to into a designated, uh, sorry, into a free zone, which is a regulated free zone. If you're regulated into DIFC, then you can claim the benefit of being a qualifying free zone person and thus uh, claim the 0% taxation. Going to the next question. Will all income derived from sale to another free zone subject to 0%? Yes, to the extent it is not from excluded activities, no. I, I think 100% should answer this right. So can we see the results? So I think 8% of people still feel that no income derived from sale even to another free zone person will be subject to 0% taxation. The correct answer is of course yes as to the extent as also explained earlier by Kushal in the uh, presentation that whenever there is any income that is derived from a free zone with respect to another free zone it will be straight away treated as and subject to your qualifying income thus it will be treated as and subject to your 0% taxation. Moving on to another question. Can a qualifying free zone person benefit from 375,000 dirhams benefit and the zero tax ban rate in respect of non-qualifying income? If they would have heard Kushal correctly, I hope they will answer it right. So can we have the results please? So 69% of the people have answered it at no and still 31% people feel that their non-qualifying income will come under this uh, tax yeah. band of 375. So unfortunately, if you're qualifying free zone <laughs> person and if you're earning qualifying income and non-qualifying income, then the D minus hits. So then if you are not opting yourself as, you know, normal free zone entity, then this benefit will never be applicable to you. So... I hope that clarifies the qualifying free zone person cannot take this benefit of 375. Next question. Will a free zone person be required to register and file a UAE corporate tax return? Yes, no. That was the quickest, I think, that everyone answered with 100% of course mentioning as that yes, they will be required to register and file the corporate yeah. tax return. So audience is attentive. Next question. Yeah, will a company generating income from sale of ice cream and DFC treated as qualifying income? And I think a lot of people asked about natural person at sales to natural person. So yeah, will it be treated as qualifying income? Earlier the ratio was 80-20. Now the ratio has become 73-27 where still 27% people feel that yes, it will be treated as your qualifying income. But unfortunately, as uh, I think it was very well explained by Kushal itself that Whenever you are selling or you're having any income from a natural person, that, that income will exclusively be treated as your excluded activity and income that you're deriving from a natural person will be treated as a non-qualifying income. So you cannot get the benefit of 0% taxation when you're doing or dealing directly with a natural person.
So will a free zone branch of a mainland or foreign juridical person need to register and file a separate UAE corporate tax return? Very interesting question. It's a very cut to cut competition mm -hmm. and the answers are almost 50-50 where 50% 50 wow. people feel that yes it will be 46% people feel that no they do not need to do a separate registration but still 51% feel that they will be required to register. So just to clarify on this question that no the, the correct answer is of course no that only the mainland and the foreign juridical person your main entity or your parent entity or holding company will be required to register and file as branch does not have a separate legal uh, legal status of itself it does not need to do a separate registration it will the mainland company or your foreign company under which you will incorporate or state here yeah, that, that it is a branch so that way you'll have to do the, the registration but branch itself cannot have a separate registration under the corporate tax coming to the last question for the uh, for today's session can a foreign company benefit from free zone corporate tax regime Two more seconds. Yes, Karishma. So majority of the people, I think 65% feel that uh, no, they are not, they cannot claim the benefit of this free zone, but the unfortunately the correct answer is yes. Let me just explain you on this, that if you are a foreign company and you are registering as a branch into the free zone, then you can claim the benefit of being a qualifying free zone person. Of course, if you are having your company located as a subsidiary or as a separate legal entity where you do not have, you know, separate status in that way, yes, in that case, of course, people are right that they cannot claim it but the benefit that you may get being a foreign company is that you can register as a branch and you can claim the benefit so yeah those were all the poll questions for today uh yeah i are think there are a couple questions. of clarifications yeah which we will take specifically i think i i miss miss uh answered one of the questions of rose that i will cover on the offshore entity but before that there is some anonymous attendee that had uh, he or she has written that there are three, three filters. First, we need to be a designated free zone, which DMCC is not. Second, we need to be qualifying. And third, it has to be high seas sales. So, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you need to understand that if you're talking about high seas sales, yes, DMCC is probably out. But for other activities, DMCC is not out is what we meant when we are talking about these filters. So, I hope that clarifies. But if, if you're only dealing in high seas sales, and, you know, if, if that is not trading of commodities, which is recognized stock exchange, then definitely you will have to probably plan it. But otherwise, the MCC is absolutely getting the benefit from trading of commodities. So those entities registered there will definitely enjoy the benefit subject to all other conditions getting uh, fulfilled. Uh, we are, uh, so another, I wrongly registered into natural person 2020. Now I can't register for corporate tax because I'm a legal entity. In that case, my deadline is 31st May. If I go for deregistration, it will take 60 days to get approved. So in terms of avoiding penalty, what do you suggest to do? So Karishma, this is a very tricky uh, situation. So that is why we would recommend that, you know, you, you have to take, obviously you have to take a uh, uh, corporate tax registration and, uh, now, if you have registered a natural person, you need to apply and reapply, re-register as well as reapply. So that's that's the best solution. So, uh, Karishma, if you can throw some light on this. Yeah, sure. I think this this is the problem that many of the people have been facing that when they registered originally for the VAT, at that time, the legal person was not that correct selected for many of the companies. It's not the case for all of the companies or all of the persons. So in that case, what is being done is now, Earlier, there was very a uh, mandatory requirement that first you'll have to update all the existing details under your VAT, and then only you are able to apply for your corporate tax. The ministry, the FTA has, you know, few days back came with some clarification stating that they will come, they will come with some solution for these kind of people where they are not able to register under corporate tax because of some error into their VAT. So if that is being, uh, you know, released quite that is if that is being released then of course you can get this benefit and you may be able to register within your due date 
but if it does not in the meantime at least you proceed with your deregistration first they say that it will take 60 days of time but it may come earlier as well you don't stop your deregistration process in the meantime if in in that time it comes with any clarification then of course it will be beneficial for you so that that would be the recommendation that we may give on this part excellent so a uh, couple of more questions before we jump into the offshore companies so we are in trading business of pumps and after sale services from designated zone so uh, whether these after sale services will qualify as qualifying activity so as mentioned and uh, correct my understanding karishma and kushal but i understand this after sale service will not qualify as a qualifying income only the trading business will qualify so if it doesn't meet the de minimis criteria unfortunately it will be taxed at 9% so the uh, you need to understand and take a detailed understanding of whether you can hive off this after sale services to another entity if that is the case that's the best solution otherwise your entire income will be 9% taxed uh, if you cross the threshold of uh, de minimis or 5 million dirhams i i hope that clarifies your uh, you know answer my tax period is october 23 to september 24 i applied for liquidation before october 23 but the final liquidation certificate came on october 7 so this is technically see in this case should i register for ct for un in, in this situation it's a very subjective call but technically you applied for liquidation before your tax period so there is a chance that if you don't now apply for corporate tax registration it's fine because your liquidation if you have a proper documentation your trail and all the documentation evidence then a corporate tax registration in this case can uh, be avoided for sure because your liquidation was done prior to your tax period and obviously what is important to understand is gar is not getting impeded if gar if the purpose is to avoid corporate tax then it's a sub separate subject but if not then definitely you can you can avoid taking corporate tax registration so uh thank you so much everyone but uh, before before leaving the room i think there was one question from rose which was talking about what yeah. to select when it comes to offshore entities and i unfortunately said that offshore companies cannot register they can register but i think there's a for, uh, there's a separate uh, you know probably uh, the registration has to select some uh, some entity type which uh, karishma if you can throw some light sure on. sure sir so for them you know as an offshore entities there is nothing specific that okay, under that legal person it will be coming as an offshore entity the only thing you have to select is while registering it will be legal person incorporated into the ua and under that head you can apply and register your company being an offshore entity you may not have very specific legal person uh, when it comes to natural person or when it comes to these kind of entities it will be straight forward legal person and incorporated in the ua and then you can get your registration we uh, that is the way where you can register your offshore company and there is one more opinion which says that you know you can wait because 31st yes. may is still a month to go and there are we are expecting some clarity when it comes to offshore companies so that's obviously one of the uh, you know passages that you can wait at least till 15th may if not you can select legal entity and you can move forward but we definitely expect some clarity on offshore entities at least so that is what i meant i'm sorry if i okay. said my the registration is not open specifically if you have to collect uh, select a type offshore it's not available for sure okay. it is not available that is what i meant so that is why either we will wait or 15th may you can decide to take it as a legal entity and you know go ahead so uh, one last question sorry there is some question from an anonymous attendee that says my company in dirc and 100% shareholding owned by a foreign company at the time of registration the specific question regarding more than 25% holding owned by the entity person and we have to submit details of uh, availability and sorry entity holds more than 25% but the option is not available on the portal to enter foreign entity details any suggestion on this so uh, i think karishma you are the best person respect. to answer this yeah <laughs> but so i think it's very specific respect to registration but no problem we can answer because that is that is where people are all uh, confused all people to be very honest everyone is right now feeling that 31st may is the only due date in spite of whatever your uh, license issuance date is to to just first add on that point that 31st may is the due date for only those companies who have that license issuance date for the month of jan or feb 
if irrespective of the year it is being uh, it is being given and also for the companies who are having poem into the ue for them only the due date is 31st may apart from that uh, uh, apart from that all the companies the due date or the deadline for registration is based on your license issuance date in your case as you rightly mentioned so that there uh, of course it is required so in your case what you have to do is there is nothing of course specific where you'll have to enter as a foreign company and then you will you what you have to do is while registering it is a foreign company having the place of effective management in the ua that is one of the legal type that is being open so you'll have to register your company under that option and under that you will have to enter difc as your company so that is the only option where you can do the registration that uh, in this way you can easily register your company if still you have any problem you can let us know we can help you on registering this but that is that is one of the option where you can register your company so i hope that clarifies excellent i think uh, all the questions are answered and we've done the poll as well so thank you so much everyone for attending and i hope it was uh, fruitful any queries you have please feel free to write to us and we'll be more than happy to answer so thank you once again and thank you karishma and kushal for a interesting webinar thank you thank you so thank much you. everyone thank have you, a nice thank day you. Thank, you. thank you bye bye